We're talking about Christianity's great hang-up with the issue between law and grace. I promised you a solution to Romans 6.14 about Paul's statement, uh, we're not under law, but under grace. So today we begin with a question. What would happen if before the cross, individuals were saved by keeping the law, and after the cross, they were saved by grace? Let's think about that for a moment. Let's consider the story of a man back in the Old Testament. Remember the man who went out from the camp of Israel to gather sticks on the Sabbath day. Let's read it in Numbers 15, verses 32 to 34. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Now, why was this man gathering sticks upon the Sabbath? Well, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But whatever the reason, it was an absolute defiance of God. He knew God had said that the Sabbath was his special day. He knew that God had said that no one was to do work on the Sabbath. But he was determined to show God, I will do what I want to do on this day. And so he went around gathering up sticks. The people who saw him doing this brought him to Moses. But Moses didn't know what to do with him. He waited for word from God. Notice now verse 35. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. Wow. Now, some people have told me Moses had this man stoned to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Moses had it ordered. But notice what the Bible says. Who commanded that this man die for his sin? The Lord, not Moses. Now, many Christians believe that this side of the cross, we don't need to worry about obeying the law because we are saved by grace. But let me ask you, does God change? Would the Lord God cause a man to be put to death back in Old Testament times because he defied God and willfully disobeyed the Sabbath commandment and yet, on this side of the cross, willingly save individuals who likewise disobey his Sabbath commandment? Does that make sense? But now, let's draw out this story to its logical conclusion. Imagine with me that the new Jerusalem has descended to earth and the redeemed of all ages are safely inside the city. Now, let's suppose that I'm among the saved. I lived on earth after the cross, and I'm one of those who believe that because I'm saved by grace, I don't need to be obedient to the commandments. Everything is fine. The Sabbath, well, I never worried much about that. After all, I'm living under grace now. Now I step over to the wall of the city of Jerusalem and I see a man just outside the city among those who are lost. Come over here a minute, I call to him. I want to talk to you. He gets as close to the wall as he can and I call down, what terrible sin did you commit that you're outside the city and lost forever? He answers, you remember reading in the Bible about the man who picked up stones on the Sabbath? Yes. Well, I'm that man. I willfully disobeyed God and as a result, I'm lost. There's no hope for me. He pauses and he looks up to me there up on the wall. Uh, uh, tell me, he says, since you are there inside the city, oh, you must have kept God's Sabbath day faithfully as God commanded. In fact, 
You must have kept all of his commandments. I shrug and say, no, I didn't pay any attention to the Sabbath. I never kept it even once. Why, we didn't pay much attention at all to the Ten Commandments. You see, I lived in the New Testament times and I was saved by grace. I didn't have to keep the commandments. Can't you just imagine that man shaking his head in confusion? Can't you hear him saying, where is the justice in this? Why am I lost? And he's safe inside the city when he did the very same thing I did. Friend, is that the kind of God we serve? Never, not for a moment. God is always the same. He doesn't change. He saves men and women today exactly the same way that individuals have been saved in every age. So how did people become so confused about law and grace? Most of the confusion goes back to one verse in the New Testament, Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now let's drill down and look at what this text is really saying. In the previous chapter, we saw that Jesus said he had not come to destroy God's law, but to make it plain, to magnify it. He said God's law would be always standing, Matthew 5, verse 17. But Romans 6, 14 seems to be saying just the opposite. Jesus says he came to preach the law more fully. And Paul says Christians are not under the law, but under grace. It's confusing, isn't it? Who is right? Whom do we believe? There must be a solution. Here's a clue. There are several kinds of law found in the Bible, just like we have different kinds of law in society. For example, in the Bible days, there are civil laws designed for the Jewish nation. If a man stole a cow, he had to return five cows to the owner. You can look at that in Exodus 22, verse 1. Uh, these are kind of like the traffic regulations or city ordinances that we have today. And these laws came to an end when the nation of Israel ended. Then there are ceremonial laws dealing with sacrifices, offerings, duties of the priests, religious feasts, etc. These all pointed forward to Messiah and his role as our Savior. Lambs and sacrifices. We don't follow these laws today either because they ended when Jesus died on the cross as the true Lamb of God. This is crystal clear in Ephesians 2.15, Colossians 2.13-17. Now, many Christians point to these texts in Ephesians and Colossians as evidence that God's law was abolished at the cross. But when you look at them carefully, it's clear that these texts are talking about the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That is, all these ceremonial ordinances and regulations of the sacrificial system that pointed forward to Messiah, to Jesus. It was these laws that ended with Jesus' death, not God's Ten Commandments, because Jesus had come and fulfilled all that they pointed forward to. So now there's another kind of law that we find in the Bible, a third law. It's God's Holy Ten Commandment law, the moral law, we call it. This is the law that is described in Psalm 19, verses 7 and 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It never needs changing because it's perfect. Notice Psalm 111, 7 and 8. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. God's Ten Commandment law is eternal. 
It's like God. It has always been in existence and it always will be. It will never change because God never changes. The law is a reflection of God's eternal character. And that's precisely why God gave us this Ten Commandment law to define right and wrong. And right and wrong don't change, do they? I mean, it's always been wrong to worship idols, to take God's name in vain, to break the Sabbath, to lie, to kill, to cheat, to steal, to, to, steal, to commit adultery. It's always been wrong to do these things, and it always will be. God's Ten Commandments are not temporary like the ceremonial or civil laws. Speaking of this moral law, Paul said in Romans 7:12, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And he says that we New Testament believers establish this law by faith, Romans 3:31. So, what's the solution to Romans 6.14? Would you like to know the simple answer why Christianity is so hung up on this problem of law and grace? It's because most people haven't read the whole text. Most people haven't, they just stopped reading once they've read the words, you are not under the law, but under grace. And they haven't continued to read what else Paul says before and after these words. It's as simple as that. The truth is that most people have missed Paul's real point in these verses. Let's take a closer look at what he is saying. In verses 12 and 13, Paul is saying to these Roman Christians, you are Christians now, so you shouldn't be sinning all the time, breaking the law. Then comes verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. In other words, you are not still sinners living under the condemnation of God's law, that holy law that tells you what is wrong with your life. Instead, you've come to Christ and have been forgiven. So you're no longer under the law's condemnation and dominion. You're under God's grace now. But notice especially verse 15. This is the conclusion Paul draws from what he is saying. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. I mean, Paul is crystal clear that the person who has been forgiven by God's grace will not continue to go right ahead and disobey God's commandments. Over in Romans 6.1, he makes it so plain it's impossible to misunderstand. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? These verses aren't telling us we have license to sin. They are a glorious promise that sin shall not overcome us, rule over us, condemn us, have dominion over us. If we keep coming to Christ, we're not under condemnation. We can have victory over sin and freedom from the condemnation of the law. God's grace gives, gives us the freedom and the power to live obedient lives to keep the law. That's true salvation. Do you think for one moment that Jesus would have gone all the way to Calvary so that men and women could go ahead and sin all they please? Never. Please. Jesus came to save people from their sins, not in their sins. So here's the good news. We needn't be hung up about this verse any longer. The wonderful news is that God's law and His grace work together. It isn't law or grace. It's law and grace. The law has always had its purpose down through the ages 
to point out our sins and the necessity of going to Jesus for grace. Amazing grace. The law points us to Jesus who provides grace. He provided salvation on Calvary's cross to save us from the condemnation of his broken law. It's true, friend, that the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ is the only way we will ever make it to heaven. It's true that in our own strength we cannot obey the commandments. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ can do for you and me what we can't possibly do for ourselves. He forgives our sins and saves us. Then he gives us his grace and power to live in harmony with his law. He brings us back into a right relationship with God. Do you want to receive the full measure of God's grace? Do you want his power to enable you to live in obedience to all of his will? All you have to do is ask. Mm -hmm.